watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And I am back with Professor Abraham Loeb of Harvard University. Now we've talked about Proxima b a lot, but there's also another red dwarf with some planets that um, that we should touch on. Trappist one. This seems to be a strange system with some possibly very interesting planets in it. Um, do you think that, given a long enough time, you know, say we have a billion years, do you think we could get there and colonize that if there's something suitable there? Yeah, potentially yes. But we need to keep in mind that the, the stars that we currently see close to us will not be there uh, in a million years. I mean, they, there will be other stars closer to us uh, within a million years. So, I, I mean, although TRAPPIST-1 is currently, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10 times farther than, than uh, Proxima Centauri, it's, pretty, it's in our neighborhood, there might be other stars coming close and we could consider going there. Um, and, and TRAPPIST-1 is particularly interesting because it has seven planets and uh, three of them are in the habitable zone. Um, and um, the other interesting thing is if one of them has life on it, uh, then life can hop from one planet to another easy, much more easily than, than in the solar system between Earth and Mars, for example. Panspermia, we know that, yeah. Panspermia. We know that rocks uh, can uh, be ejected from a planet through impacts. And in fact, there are some Martian uh, rocks that made it to the Earth and vice versa. And we have evidence for that. Uh, and if uh, there is a form of life that is resilient enough to survive the journey, and, and there are such forms of life. For example, tardigrades are these small water bearers. They are microscopic in size, and uh, but they are very resilient. They can reproduce their DNA if, if it's damaged. And so some of the, a group of those were, was taken to space and exposed to uh, the radiation from the sun, the ultraviolet X-ray radiation, the, the bombardment of cosmic rays, uh, dehydration and uh, and vacuum and, and when they were brought back to earth about half of them produced um, viable embryos again so you can imagine uh, some forms of life being resilient to travel through space and surviving in the core of a rock uh, that is thick enough to protect them and um, that is called the panspermia the process of transferring life from one planet to another of course, this is natural transpermia, where a rock be is being ejected due to the impact of an asteroid. Uh, you could also imagine panspermia that is intentional by a, a civilization that simply wants to send, to produce copies elsewhere, to send uh, spacecrafts. Um, and so that, that is artificial panspermia. Um, uh, so um, in, in the TRAPPIST-1 system, uh, the, the planets are much more densely packed. They are closer to each other, uh, and many of them have roughly uh, the size of the Earth. Uh, the, and so if one of them has life on it, simply because they are closer together, um, one can show that it's much more likely for them to transfer life from one to another. And uh, as a result, uh, panspermia is more likely to take place in the TRAPPIST-1 system if it has life than uh, in the solar system. Now that, that brings up a question because there's, there are forms of simple life on Earth. Uh, for example, there's a bacterium, Dinococcus radiodurans, that can, it can survive enormous amounts of radiation exposure. So it would suggest that, you know, they think it's because it, it evolved the ability to dry out and then that somehow gives it this radiation protection. But it makes you wonder if, if Earth life, if we go out and look at Europa, could Earth have contaminated these worlds um, at some point? Or, could, or vice, vice versa. Or vice versa. Could life yes. have, have been started on Mars and ended up uh, migrating here through panspermia? So, so this, this is an excellent point. And one of the reasons to search for life in the solar system and beyond uh, would be to see if we do find evidence for life. In the solar system, we can actually uh, examine it. Uh, you know, without traveling to other stars, we won't be able to examine it. We just see some 
molecules, uh, you know, the spectral fingerprints of some molecules. But when in the solar system, we can actually check what kind of life is by sending a probe that will collect a sample. And if we find that, um, for example, all the f molecules of life have the same chirality as life on Earth, and if they originate from the same type of DNA, RNA that life on Earth uh, originated from, then it would mean that potentially it was transferred from one object to another. Um, the question is whether this is more exciting to find than realize that there are completely other, very different pathways uh, to having life that are completely different from the way we have life on, on Earth that we can see as completely distinct. And if we find life as we don't know it uh, elsewhere, in my mind, this would be even more exciting. Uh, so in the first case, you would perhaps realize there might be some special reason why um, life as we know it is, is the only path, or maybe there was panspermia. In the second case, you will know for sure that, you know, life has multiple paths, that it's not unique to what we find here on Earth, and that where we found it, uh, that place was not in contact with Earth, because otherwise we would have seen evidence for that on Earth. Um, and so uh, that's an exciting question that awaits our future discoveries. And I should say a very important thing on, on, on the future of the search for life, um, that um, in, in the context of physics, um, we discovered the laws of physics in the laboratory first. I, I mean, of course, Newton uh, realized some of them by looking at the planets, um, data from planets. But uh, most of the understanding of modern physics came from laboratory experiments. And then we went out to the universe and we applied what we learned from laboratory experiments and it seems to work. And we uh, improved our understanding of the universe thanks to our understanding of laboratory physics. Uh, the same should be done in the context of uh, the search for life. And it's not being done right now. There are only a handful of groups pursuing the goal of producing life in the laboratory. Now, if they are successful, if we are able to produce life in the laboratory, we can change the conditions um, and then ask whether life can develop under extreme conditions that exist elsewhere, on other planets, on other objects. Uh, we can answer your question from uh, before about um, whether life could develop under a sheet of, of ice. Um, and then... Um, uh, we could also ask the question of whether there are different paths to, to making, to forming life. And once we understand that better, we can then look at extreme environments uh, out there uh, in the sky and, and we will be better equipped uh, in our search because we will know what to expect. It's sort of similarly to knowing physics by, and looking at the universe. You know, if we didn't have quantum mechanics, we wouldn't be able to make the progress we, we made uh, in understanding the universe. We didn't have general relativity. Uh, we wouldn't be able to understand how the universe expands. And so the same methodology should be applied to astrobiology, to the search for life. Laboratory experiments could shed light or uh, help us understand the processes that enable life to exist and whether they are unique or not. And then we can apply the, this understanding uh, as we look at the sky. Now, that, that, that's interesting because I didn't know that. Now, we have very encouraging experiments that were done at this point long ago, like the Yuri Miller experiments that seem to suggest that the chemistry of life is fairly straightforward. We just don't really know how it goes from abiotic to biotic. But nobody's doing any real work in that? No, there are several groups, as, as I mentioned. And uh, in fact, one of them is uh, at Harvard by uh, Jack Shostak, that, led by Jess, Jack Shostak, that uh, won the Nobel Prize for, for something else, but he's now uh, focused on, on producing uh, artificial life uh, in the laboratory. Uh, and they are making progress. Uh, they haven't gotten there yet, um, but um, his group is working on it, and there are a few others, a few other groups. Um, but um, this is not 
currently a mainstream endeavor that is uh, well funded. And I think it should, because uh, if we understand the origins of life better, we could produce better medicine. We can, uh, uh, there would be a lot of practical applications uh, that would be beneficial to our society. And so I think this is one of the areas that should be better funded. And uh, not only for the sake of uh, the search for life in the universe, but also for our future understanding of uh, biological systems of our health. Now, one of the one of the problems with with thinking about uh, microbial life in the universe is that Earth sat at the 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 uh, prokaryotic level for a very long time, and seems to only have progressed to eukaryotic life after you know billion plus years. Do you, do you think that might be a filter? Do you think that's a problem? Or do you think it's just something that maybe there's another way around it or maybe it can happen quicker and you know then evolution can do its thing? Um, well, in the context of exoplanets, anyway. Yeah, this, this is a very important and deep question. And uh, it's clear that life on Earth went through uh, important milestones. And um, uh, we don't know how general that is and what triggered these transitions. Um, and so we are sort of in the dark in trying to um, figure out the implications for other planets. But um, one can at least uh, argue that the diversification of species uh, and the complexity of life uh, that we find here on Earth really needed those uh, steps, those transitions. and. And on planets that have very different conditions than Earth, these might not be uh, available, might not be possible. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, uh, one can show that uh, uh, if there is uh, not enough ultraviolet light, uh, so for example, um, these dwarf stars, they are cooler than the sun and they don't produce much UV light. And we know that UV light is, is useful for life. And, um, or if the surface temperature of a planet is, is too cold, this uh, complexity of life uh, will, will probably not develop as quickly as it did on Earth. And uh, on Earth, you know, we reached uh, the level of um, adv an advanced civilization uh, only at the end. Uh, and so um, it probably doesn't exist on, in, in, in those other places. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs>